Hi everybody, it's me, R. Dallas. In this video, I want to talk to you about the Reaper pattern and how it's used with clean architecture. I first came up with the Reaper pattern in late 2019 as I was trying to make improvements to the organization of my controller-based API endpoints. Not long after, I developed a simple library called API endpoints that was based on ASP.NET Core MVC controllers and which became pretty popular. Many projects still rely on this package and its successor, Fast Endpoints, which is more full-featured and is built on the newer Minimal APIs feature set. Now, before we get into this topic, I want to let you know about a new course I just published recently on modular monoliths. I really think this is the approach you should be using for most non-trivial applications, and I show how to make it work alongside clean architecture in the deep dive course. I've published it on Nick Chapsis's Dome Train, and he does an amazing job of recommending it, so let me turn it over to him for just a moment. Now, before I move on, I'd like to let you know that we just launched a brand new course on Dome Train called Deep Dive into Modular Monoliths. And it's a direct sequel from the Getting Started delivered a few weeks ago by our Dallas of Steve Smith. Steve did an amazing job with that first course and you loved it. So we had to get out the Deep Dive one as fast as possible just to see how the whole application is completing and being ready to go to production with more features and more modules to have a complete modular monolith, which in case you don't know, I think it's the Goldilocks zone between microservices and old bad monoliths. It's where most people, and by most, I mean almost everyone should start before they feel like they have to go anywhere else, maybe microservices or maybe even further. Both the deep dive and the getting started should be taken by every .NET developer working in modern .NET. There's so many best practices you're going to learn there. And to celebrate the launch of the deep dive, you can use code modular20 at checkout or use the link in the description to claim 20% off that course. And you can also add the getting started course in your basket for a massive discount if you don't have that already. And on top of that, we also have a From Zero to Hero modular models bundle now, which allows you to combine both courses with a 20% discount. Okay, now back to the video. All right, now let's take a look at where the request endpoint response or Reaper pattern came from. It started with this article that I wrote back in 2019. And in this, I'm talking about how to move from separate controllers and actions to using endpoints with Mediator in between. So I talk a little bit about Mediator. We look at how a, a typical endpoint might look like as a controller action. And then we split these up so that the controller gets to be a little bit smaller and we put all the logic into a handler. So now my action is just Mediator.send and a little bit of work creating the command. But wait, we can actually just have the command come in from model binding and now we don't even have to do anything except send this command right to the mediator handler. Now, of course, if every one of your actions looks like this, then what's the point of having all those actions? In fact, you could instead just have mediator be built into your base API controller and set that with property injection. And now you're going to have a much simpler setup. You can have one endpoint in one file and all of this is working back in .NET Core 3.1, .NET 5, long ago in, in current times, all right? So then a little bit later, I created my library, which we're gonna look at in a second, called API Endpoints. And I wrote an article, I talked about how MVC controllers are dinosaurs. I kind of got that from this Dino's Comics that I modified slightly, in which they say, how are you with MVC? I hate it. Ah, must be an experienced user then which I think really does describe how most people feel about MVC if they've been using it for a while. So let's talk about why that is. All right, if we jump in here and we look at this quick view of what the model view controller looks like, the entry point for a request is gonna be on that controller. It's gonna be routed to a particular action method. In there, it's gonna work with some model. It's generally going to then return a view. And in many implementations, it's going to also have a view model that it passes to the view. So let's look at what a, a typical file structure might appear. Here we have a folder with controllers for customers and products and some other things. We have some models. These would probably be in a different project. If you're using something like clean architecture, those would be in your core. This would be your domain model. You have view models. You'd probably have more than the ones I'm showing here. This is just real simple. It's a little typo there, but go with it. And then you have your views. And of course the view structure in traditional .NET MVC is very tied to how your controllers are structured. So you have to have an admin folder, a customer's folder, et cetera, if you have an admin controller and a customer's controller. 
Uh, and so for simple CRUD operations of add, delete, etc., you might have a structure that looks like this. And when you go to work on something, you will have to go and navigate between all these different folders. If you add another type of controller, let's say it's for a shopping cart, you're going to have to add a shopping cart controller in the controllers folder. You'll probably use the cart model that I've already added here. You'll have cart view models. And then inside here, you'll have another shopping cart folder with a bunch of separate pages in there to work with it. So one of the inspirations for my API endpoints project, and in fact, the Reaper pattern was Razor Pages. So let's look at Razor Pages real quick. Razor Pages shipped with .NET Core 2. And in Razor Pages, the requests come directly into the page model. Instead of having a controller with an action method, you're going to have a handler called on get or on post or something similar. And that page model is going to return back a page. So instead of having separate action methods on a separate class, you have a base class, which is the page model. And that also doubles as your view model. So it's still going to work with your domain model. That's this model up here, but all it needs to operate on is a page, which is what the view would have been. Now, the benefit of this is that everything is grouped together. You don't have to go and jump around in quite as many folders. Looking at the folder structure here, you'd still have the same models, but when you need to work on a, let's say, customer page, everything you need from the controller action, which is now an event handler, to the, uh, the view model, which is now the page, to the actual view, which is now the page.cshtml, the razor part, all of that is in one place, in one folder, and possibly even in just one file although you can break it up and use a code behind for the C-sharp parts. Now let's look at how that translates into the Reaper pattern. So with the Reaper pattern, you have a request, which is a strongly typed class, and that request goes and reaches an endpoint. That endpoint is going to work with whatever your domain model might be. It's going to generate a response, and then it's going to send that response, which again is a strongly typed thing, to the client. This pattern is designed to work with APIs. That's why you don't see any views or pages here. But you can see that it's using a very similar approach to Razor Pages in that we'll typically have a root folder called endpoints. Or if you have really simple projects, you can have just a root folder called customers. And everyone just knows that the endpoints are inside that folder. Or if you like, you could call it customer endpoints. And then inside of that, you'll have add or delete. And attached to those will be those strongly typed request and response types. So typically what I do, and you'll see in a moment in Visual Studio, is I'll use a naming convention to make it so that the request and response types can be associated with the actual endpoint that they go with. You can learn more about the Reaper design pattern on deviq.com. It's detailed there in a, this relatively short article that describes how it works. It's pretty straightforward as patterns go. You can also find the original API endpoints project on GitHub, as well as on NuGet, where it's had about 2.2 million downloads. And my recommended approach if you're building APIs now in .NET Core 8 or later is that you would use fast endpoints. And the reason for that is that fast endpoints also follows the Reaper pattern. You can see right here, you generate a request and a response. These could be classes or records. And then you have an endpoint that inherits from an endpoint of request comma response and has a handle method. The reason I now recommend fast endpoints is that it is not based on MVC. It is using ASP.NET Core minimal APIs, which first shipped a couple of years ago and are the modern way to build APIs using ASP.NET Core. So what does this have to do with clean architecture? Well, if you use my clean architecture solution template that's also available on NuGet and GitHub, you will see that it is using fast endpoints for all of its APIs. If you look at the packages that it's referencing, you'll see fast endpoints and fast endpoints.swagger are listed there. And the default contributor endpoints that are shown here are using fast endpoints as well. If you look, for example, at the update endpoint, you'll see that it has a request and a response as well as a validator all attached to it. Uh, so when you wanna work on a given endpoint, everything you need is right there, right? Here's the endpoint itself. In this case, it's also using mediator to do a send to a use case. And there's some good reasons why you still might wanna do that. But otherwise, a lot of the logic is, is in this endpoint. One of the nice things about endpoints is that there is only one class per endpoint. So it's really easy to find them and think about them and, and organize them in your code base. And it also eliminates a lot of merge conflicts that you might get when you are working with those really big controllers 
and you had a lot of stuff going on and different reasons for different developers to touch that same file. Now, the only reason you're going to touch this file is if you're working on this endpoint. Then, of course, the request is right here with it and not in some other folder for API models or view models or what have you. It's a request. It's a DTO. It's attached to the endpoint that it works with, as is the response, which is right here. In addition to those two things, if you're using fast endpoints, by simply having this validator in here as well, it'll automatically be called by any request that is made to this endpoint. And so you get fluent validation support basically for free without you having to add it to your endpoint or to your controller actions or by adding any filters or anything like that yourself. It's just baked into how fast endpoints works. If you want to see how it all works, you can certainly use it in Swagger. We can go to a contributor. We can get a list of all the contributors and you'll see there are two here. If we go to the update and we want to change contributor ID one and give it a new name that is just A, we'll execute that and you'll see that we're going to get a 400 that says the length of name must be at least two characters. You entered one. Another feature that we have now in Visual Studio is that we can essentially do the same thing. We can go and fetch a contributor here. And then if we want to modify it, we can do the same thing here. And again, if we change it to one character and send the request, we're going to get that same validation because of that validator that we have. I hope you found this helpful and that you think that the Reaper pattern could be useful for you as well. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. I'll make sure all the links are in the description for this video and keep on improving.